In this video, we're going to be building a multiplayer game using JavaScript and Firebase. If you've never heard of Firebase before, it's a hosted real-time database solution that offers many features you need to create online multiplayer games. It makes it really easy to implement real-time live updates, it's backed by Google, it's well-supported, very stable, I love using it. Let's take a quick look at the game that we're going to build in this video. It's pretty simple, but you can take these concepts and apply them to whatever game you want to make. There's going to be this room here where players can join and navigate around with the arrow keys. You can name your player and choose your appearance. At the end, we'll add coins that randomly get added to the world, and then you can race your friends to see who can collect the most coins. We're going to build this whole thing from start to finish with just vanilla JavaScript and the Firebase library. As always, you can take these concepts and apply them to whatever front-end framework you like to use. But first, hello, my name is Drew. I make videos about game development on this YouTube channel. Some are tutorials like this one, others are more devloggy, just talking about things I've learned by making games. If you're interested in any of that, please subscribe. Let's get started. So let's start by taking a quick look at the project that we'll be working with today. Here I have a new project on my machine and it's pretty minimal, but we'll just walk through it quickly here. So I have an index.html file with some basic information in the head tag, like uh, meta tags and a font that I'm bringing in from Google fonts. I link to one style sheet here called styles.css and we'll see that in a second. The body has just this one div in it right now, the game container, and that's basically just centered in the middle of the screen. I have some commented out UI that we'll bring in as we go. Uh, this video is gonna be kind of a combination of live coding and just quickly bringing in elements, basically because I wanna focus on the Firebase stuff. That's kind of what we're here to talk about. But as always, the code is all linked below so you can check it out there for more detail. I'm linking to this app.js file here and that's where most of our work is gonna happen. Let's just take a quick look at the style sheet now. So in styles.css, I have some basic rules on the HTML and body tags, things that reset some spacing, add a background color, bringing in that font, and then centering the game container in the middle of the screen. Let's see what this looks like so far. Here's our scene, we have our game container. It's using a background image that's being loaded in here, and then we have a set width and height that match that background image. So if you change this out with your own image, you can update that part. The image is pretty small on its own, so we're scaling it up uh, by three times. And then because we're using pixel art, we can utilize this image rendering pixelated to retain crispy, nice looking graphics. Here we have some basic styles for some of that commented out UI that we'll bring in in a second. It's basically just some basic form stuff to make it look a little bit nicer. So let's include Firebase into our project now. At this point, we need to actually set up an app within Firebase, like create a new project. Uh, it might involve you signing up for the service and that kind of thing. I'm going to do a screen recording of that process now. And it's worth noting that Firebase does have paid tiers, but everything we're going to do today, we're just going to use the free tier, and that's going to be more than enough. So first, we'll go to firebase.google.com, and you should see the landing page here. If you're logged in with your Google account, you'll see your avatar over here, and you can click this Go to Console button. If you've been here before, you'll see your existing projects. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and press this Add New Project button. We can name it, so I'll say something like Multiplayer Demo, say Continue. It's going to ask if you want to add analytics automatically to your project. I'm going to opt out of that now, but feel free to research this and figure out if that's something you want. For the tutorial, we're just going to say no. Now this might take a second. I'm picturing a lot of beeps and boops happening in some server somewhere. Okay, and it's ready. So I'll go ahead and click continue. We're redirected to our console page, I guess you'd call it. The first thing we need to do is go into this real-time database section here and enable the real-time database for this project that we created inside Firebase. So I'll say create database and you can choose your zone. US Central works for me. Just for now, you can go ahead and start the project in locked mode. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, and now here we've been redirected to the real-time database viewer page, and this is essentially our JSON object type of thing in the cloud. And so this is what our JavaScript game is gonna talk to and use. The next thing we're gonna do is configure some authentication types. So I'll go to this authentication page, click get started. Now Firebase offers a ton of different options for authentication. They've even added more since I've been here last. This is really sweet, all the stuff they have. Uh, but we're gonna use basically just this really simple one called Anonymous. So I'll click that and click Enable here. And you can come back here and enable, like opt into other ones as you want them. But this is all we're gonna need, I think. So we'll say Save. Next, we need to add our JavaScript configuration so that our web page can actually connect to this Firebase instance. So we'll click Project Overview. It has a few icons here for other platforms you might be using, but we're using the web here, which is cool. You can use Unity, that's awesome. Web, 
And then here you can give it a nickname. Click this register app button. And here's what we wanted. It reveals all this code that we can basically copy and paste into our project. Now there are two main options it gives you for including this code and they basically do the same thing, but there's just two kind of different usages of them. So if you plan to use this kind of concept in a quote, like real build system with common modules and that kind of thing, here's the NPM option where you can NPM install the Firebase library into your project and then copy over this block here that's gonna give you all your configuration stuff uh, by like importing the correct functionality and that kind of thing. Again, this tutorial, we're staying real basic, so we'll probably just use the script tag option here. So I'm just gonna grab this and we'll put it in our project. Okay, so back in the code, I'm gonna go ahead and paste in uh, some Firebase configuration. This is gonna look really similar to what we saw in the Firebase console, but I've made some changes here and I'll explain that in a second. So these days, Firebase is really designed to be used as an NPM package, just like we saw in the console before. Uh, because of the simplicity I'm trying to keep with this particular tutorial, I'm opting into just using script tags. They've really broken everything up into modules, so you can just opt into what you need, which is kind of nice. First, we start with Firebase app, which is just kind of like the backbone of everything. Then we're going to bring in the authentication part, which is going to allow us to log into Firebase and then be authenticated to actually write data to it and read data from it. We're going to be wiring up to that real-time database, and so to use that functionality, we need to include this Firebase database uh, partial also. Then we have that same script block, which just configures Firebase. This is exactly what they gave us, and then I'm popping it into Firebase.initializeApp and then passing in that object. Let's take a look at app.js now and see what's in here. Basically, I've started us out with just a few helper functions. Throughout this project, we're gonna be doing a lot of pulling random values from arrays, things like spawning in random spots, and we're gonna be adding coins in random spots, a few other things too. So I have this helper just set up for us. It just takes in an array and then returns a random member of that array. Similar to the Pizza Legend series, we're gonna be dealing with grid coordinates a lot, X and Y values. Sometimes we're gonna need those as a string kind of sandwiched together. And so I have a helper here that just takes an X and Y and returns it as X, X, Y. Finally, we have this blank function that fires off as soon as the page loads. This is where our work is gonna happen. So the first thing we're gonna do is have our game log into Firebase using this method here. It's called Firebase in their auth library, a method called sign in anonymously. So our database is gonna be configured to basically not allow anybody to read or write from it unless you are signed in. But we don't wanna do the whole like email password thing for this particular video. Just hitting our domain is gonna be enough. So if you've landed on our webpage here and loaded up the Firebase JavaScript library, Firebase will kind of manage your logged in session for you. That's gonna protect us from like random bot attacks and that kind of thing. So let's go back into Firebase and check out the security rules. So from the real-time database page here, you can go into this rules tab. And here I have security rules set up for this project. Now this is demo code only. There are definitely things about this that aren't very robust and we'll, we'll see that. So when you're working on your real project, you should really have the rigor to research all these rules and make sure everything is tight for your project. This is really just for our toy demo's sake. But what we have is our basic rules object. This is like a Firebase specific kind of language that they have you write in. You can look up the docs for better examples, but we're saying as long as you're authenticated, then you can read any of the data that's in here, that's fine. By default, you can't write anything. So randos on the internet can't just like write whatever they want. We're gonna have a player's node in our database. Within the player's node is gonna be a unique ID. Firebase is gonna give us this ID when someone logs in. You get like this wacky string that's unique to you. That's gonna be your ID. Within the player node, we're saying you are allowed to write data, but only to your player node. So you must be authenticated and your authenticated ID must match this user ID. Finally, we're gonna have coins too that appear on the map. And we're saying here that anybody can basically write those coins because as you collect them, you're gonna be able to delete them, which involves you modifying this coin kind of node. Again, there are some imperfections there, but this is gonna be fine just for our demo's sake. And I'll have this whole object as part of the code download link below. So back in our code here, we're gonna let this line fire as soon as the game boots up. It's gonna to try to log us in anonymously. If anything fails, we can add this catch block. And this is good to get in the habit of doing. So if anything goes wrong, an error will appear and that error has some information for us, like a code on it that kind of tells us what happened and then a friendly error message if you wanted to show that to the user, for example. In our case, I'm just logging it to the console. 
say you skip the step of opting into the anonymous login method, like the thing we turned on earlier, you'd probably see an error for that. I don't expect us to run into any errors with what we have so far though. Now, before we fire off this call to sign in anonymously, we want to have an authentication listener set up too. And so this is kind of the way uh, Firebase has you do it. I'm going to add in another method from auth here. It's firebase.auth on auth state changed. And as soon as it changes, we'll get a user back. So let me close this up. And here I can just console.log user. And the pattern here is basically if you got a user back, then you know that you're logged in. But if you like logged out or something happened to your session, then this callback would fire, but user would be null. And so in this case, you're logged out. So again, the flow here is that when the app boots up, we're going to listen for auth changes, and then we're going to trigger an auth change by signing in anonymously, and then that should cause our inner part here to fire. This is the clear signal that we are logged in and ready to start reading and writing data. Here in our game, if I pop open the console and reload, you'll see that console log fires. Our user is this like really complicated object. You can spindle through here and see everything that's in here. The thing we really care about is the UID. This is that unique string that's unique to me. This is going to be our player ID. So here we're going to start scoping some variables uh, to this inner function here. So I'm going to be ready for player ID. And I'm also going to create something called a player ref. And we'll talk about that more in a second here. And then when this user call fires, I'm going to go ahead and populate those values now. So player ID is going to be user.id. That's the thing we just saw in the console. And next, we're going to set up our player ref. A ref is how you interact with a Firebase node. And so in our case, our player that we're logged in as is going to be its own node in the tree. We're going to have a reference to that node, and then we can update it, like change our name, change our position, change our color of the character appearance we have. We can also delete ourselves from the tree when we close the browser and exit the game. All of that happens by interacting with a ref here. And so the way you set that up looks like this firebase.database.ref, and then you give it a path to the node in the tree. We're going to be nested under players here. This doesn't exist yet in the tree, but as soon as this function fires, or as soon as we write data to this ref for the first time, it kind of creates the deep path. So it'll create the player's parent for us, and then it's going to create a node for our player ID. We'll see that in a second. So to write the data to our ref, we can say player ref.set. And in set, you can pass it an object or a value. Uh, say it was just going to be like a string or something. You could just do a string here. Uh, but we're going to be a little bit more complex than that. So I'll start a new object. We'll give our player a name. And I'll just say Drew for now, even though we're going to change that pretty quickly. We're also going to have a direction that we're facing. And that's either going to be right or left. So I'll say right. A color can be blue. We'll give ourselves an x, y. So I'll say like x, y. I'm just making these up. We'll start with zero coins for this player. We'll cover the coins kind of at the end of the video, but I'm just sort of laying some architecture for it. And then, of course, uh, one thing that's going to be really helpful is including the ID also within the object. So I'll say ID is going to be player ID. And I already messed this up. This should be UID instead of ID. So when I reload our page now, nothing visually has changed, of course, but under the hood, we've done that command to write data to Firebase. So let's go into our database and just see what it looks like. So now when we look back at the real-time database, you should see data appearing, and it's going to match exactly what we sent up. See the ID came through, the name, all of that stuff. And now this is cool too. If you open an incognito tab and go to that same domain, see that now I have two instances of the game running another player has appeared in here randomly. It's going to match because all of that, you know, all the values for the keys are hard coded right now, except for the ID. See, this ID is different than this one. So as people join our game, each person is going to get assigned a new ID that's unique to them. And you can see that that's working okay here. Now let's do a quick spike to make these values unique because again, as, as everybody joins, they're all going to look the same and be at the same spot. And that's not cool. So uh, first I'm going to make a unique name. I'll make a function here called create name. I'll go up here and just kind of paste this in. I prepared this before recording the video, but there's a function called create name. It's just going to take a list of prefixes and choose a random one. Remember, we have that random helper up here, uh, just, you know, like an adjective and then um, an animal. So it'll kind of splice together prefix animal like dope seal. Um, you can take this and make it your own. Anyway, I think it's kind of fun, like Google Docs style. So I'll collapse this because it's taking up a lot of space. But basically, we're going to create that name randomly. 
and then use it here. Because the name of the variable matches the name of the key here, we can just um, do this instead. We can keep right like this, that's fine. But let's do something to randomize the color. Here I'm gonna use our helper method again, random from array, and pass in a list called player colors. And at the top of the file up here, I'm gonna go ahead and bring this in. We're gonna start adding data about our game at the top of the file here. So first, player colors. This is just a array of strings. We're gonna add some styles that use these strings in a second, but it's worth noting that they line up exactly as our sprite sheet does in the same order. So now we're joining the game whenever our browser boots up, and that's good. Uh, but now we want to do the reverse. So if we leave the game, if we don't do anything right now, our player would just kind of like remain in the game stale. So other players would just see like the ghost of our remaining character there. So what we're going to do now is add another operation on the ref, and it looks like this. It's playerref.onDisconnect. And so this comes from Firebase. This means whenever the browser is disconnected from the session, we want to do something with the player ref. And so we're going to say remove. Okay, so here's our database again. We have those two sessions open. I still have that incognito tab open. Off screen here, I'm gonna close the incognito tab. And as soon as I do that, that on remove thing should fire and you, we should see one of these nodes disappear. Okay, so here it goes. Nice, so Firebase picked up on it right away. It flashes red for a second. Red means something's uh, getting removed and then that yellow meant that something inside the tree is changing. We'd also see it appear green when new things appear, which is kind of nice. We can see that now. Here comes a new incognito tab. Green. There we go. So now we've joined the game. We're ready to kick off the functionality of the game just locally for us. And so I'll say init game. So I'll come up here and make a new function here called init game. And this is where we're going to do some kickoff stuff. Now that everything is ready to go, we can start drawing characters to the screen. And the first thing I want to do is create two new refs in Firebase. So the first one's going to be all players ref. This is going to be a reference uh, to every player in the game, where previously that player ref we have is only ours. And that's the one we have access to update and write. But we can read all of them. That's how we're going to be able to see other players in the world. And then just for later, I'm setting up this all coins ref, so we don't have to come back and do it later. But uh, we're going to use that to be able to read all the coins that are in the game world. Now we're going to start to use two new methods in our Firebase refs here, both of them on players ref first. The first one looks like this. It's all players ref dot on value. And then I'll close this up. This is a listener that's setting up a callback to fire whenever the value of this ref changes. So in other words, anytime a player joins or leaves or there's a modification within a player, this callback is going to happen. This value keyword comes from Firebase specifically. And we'll get into the snapshot bit in a second. That's how we're going to actually be able to read what the change is. So this fires um, whenever a change occurs. And now there's another similar one we're going to use called child added. And this one fires whenever a new node is added to the tree. So basically when a new player joins, this callback will fire. Now, more specifically, a good way to think about this is that child has been added that's new to me. So if the game has been going on for a while and I'm joining halfway through and there's already five players around in the world, this will fire five times right away because there's already five there that are new to my client's knowledge. Now, we're going to start adding DOM elements to our tree here. I mentioned before, or I think I mentioned it before, that I prefer to do these tutorials as vanilla JavaScript, basically just to peel away layers of abstraction that frameworks give you, like React and Angular and Vue and all those. I love those frameworks, so don't hear me wrong. But just for raw education's sake, I like to get that stuff out of the way and just deal with the basic elements here. The trade-off there is that it kind of adds some overhead on how we manage DOM elements. So here, when a player joins, we need to like manually add a new div to our scene and then whenever that player updates, we need to look up that div and update things on that div. That's where like a lot of front-end frameworks really help you out. Things like React, just rendering from state, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more manual here. But again, you can totally apply these concepts to whatever framework you like to use. I'll give us more room here. So first, let's look up the added player data. So I'll say added player is going to be snapshot.val. This is a method you call on snapshots that come from Firebase refs. You could console log this and dig through it. There's a lot of crazy stuff in there, but this is pretty much, in my experience, all you're ever really gonna need to do is just look up the current value. 
this will give us that object back that's gonna look exactly like what we had down here with the name and direction and color and X, Y, all that stuff. Next, we're gonna create our div in memory. So we're gonna create an element. It's just a div. We did this all the time in Pizza Legends, if you saw that series. Let's add some classes to this div now. So it's gonna have a class of character, and then we're gonna have this utility class called grid cell. We'll move over to the CSS in a second. This is gonna fire for every character that enters the scene, but it's also gonna fire for us, the player that we are logged in as. We have a bit of a one-way cycle data pattern happening here, where basically we're always just listening for events that happen on our Firebase data, and then we'll always react to those to interact with our DOM. And so we're setting up this listener. When our player joins, our listener is gonna get fired. It just follows the pattern kind of in that way. But anyway, it, if it is us that's joining now, we wanna know that uh, because we're gonna do some things that make the player just a little bit different than other players in the game. So here I'm gonna check if added player ID, which again, the ID will be present on any player that's joining, is equal to me. So that's gonna be uh, player ID. And again, we're setting that here and it's scoped up above us. We're gonna add an additional class to this element that's just you. That's gonna allow us to layer you above everybody else and then also show a little green arrow that indicates who you are on the screen. Now, so far, we still only have an empty div here. Our div is gonna have some content in it and so I'm gonna go ahead and paste some stuff now and talk through it. The inner HTML of our div is gonna have a shadow in it, our character sprite, both of which are gonna use that grid cell uh, utility class that we'll set up that just does some like sizing and spacing and positioning stuff. We're gonna have this container called character name container that shows the text above characters' heads. Inside that container, there's a space where the name will go and then also a golden span of text that will count the number of coins. We're just gonna start that as zero. Finally, we'll have this div that's called U arrow, character U arrow, and that's gonna have just a little indicator of which character you are on the screen. That's what the CSS class is for. I'm gonna indent here. And this should be the structure of our characters. Now we're creating elements on the fly here, but we need to keep a reference to these elements so that we can update them later in this callback whenever something changed, like whenever a different character moves across the map, we're gonna to need to update that div for that character. And so I'm gonna make a new object up here that's just gonna house all of our player elements. So I'll call it let player elements. It's gonna start empty. But then here, as soon as we create a new element, we wanna populate that object just at that key. So we'll say player elements, added player dot ID is gonna be a reference to that element. Now we're gonna fill in some initial state. This is gonna be like what the name is. These DOM elements are starting empty. Things like the name and the coin count are almost empty. We wanna fill those things in now. So I'll bring in two lines here. Both are doing almost the same thing. We're query selecting within our created div here, one for the name and setting the inner text of that element to added player dot name and same for coins. The next two things I'm gonna bring in are gonna be utilized by CSS to style the characters properly. And so here they come character element. We're gonna set attribute color, data color to be whatever added player dot color is. The CSS will basically use this value to position the sprite sheet correctly to show the right color. Similar with direction, it's gonna nudge the showing frame to either show the left facing one or the right facing one. Next, we know that we have a X and Y value in the player state, so we can go ahead and use that X and Y to position our character on the grid where they go. So I'm gonna bring in these lines here. We're gonna create a left value by taking our grid size and then multiplying it by just this simple grid cell position of where this character is, and then we'll add the string pixels. We're gonna do the same thing for top and Y. The only slight difference is this minus four pixels, which is basically just gonna take that character and visually nudge them up a little bit. So they're like in the middle of the cell appearance wise, instead of um, perfectly aligned with the cell borders. We'll take those two values and apply them to a CSS transform translate rule. We'll later set up a CSS transition rule that basically animates this as it changes. So instead of you just warping from like spot, 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 you, it's gonna kind of have a more like seamless, floaty, easy movement. Okay, we are finally ready to append this character to the DOM. Uh, so first let's make a, a reference to our DOM element, our game container, that's just our one 
div that we have going on here. We're going to grab this game container right after we're done creating the character and configuring it. We'll say game container dot append child, our character element. Now, if we just look at the game again real quick uh, to see what's happening, you can see that uh, our character is being injected into the screen and I can like reload the page to leave and join the game as a new character. The name randomization is working, but it obviously doesn't look right. There's no character appearance or anything like that. So let's go ahead and shift over and do the styles now. So in styles.css, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the file, make a new section for characters here and just start bringing in some styles and we'll talk through them. So first I'm going to bring in this grid cell class. We saw that a few times already. It's basically just going to make things position absolute and then size them to match the size of our grid cell, which is 16 pixels. Next, I'm going to bring in some rules for the top level character class. The first is really basic. It's just anytime the character's position moves, we want to animate that new transform value with a transition. If we include that U class on like this character on the screen is the one you are playing as, we want to make sure that they're layered above everything else. Otherwise, you'd be able to get into weird situations where someone could pass over you but be on top of you and that it just felt weird. And so this way, you're always on top. Also, if you're you, we want to go ahead and show this arrow above your head. The rest of the styles for that are going to look like this, where we're going to start with display none, you know, unless it's you, absolute positioned above the character's heads and just kind of nudged into place. To do the appearance, we're going to be using a CSS background image. That's how all the graphics in this particular demo are going to work. It's just kind of the method I felt like using for this project. I've got a bunch of different examples of other ways to do it on the channel here. OK, so next time we're going to have the CSS rules for our character sprite. This is going to use a background image of our character sprite sheet. I'll try to like put it on screen now or something. It's going to be nudged just a little bit above the grid cell, again, to just kind of have some of that visual appearance of floating, like they're like floaty balloons. Now we'll add in the bits that kind of specify which color should show at which time. And so this looks like a lot, but it's all almost doing the same thing. What it's saying is if this character has that data direction right on it, we want to go ahead and shift the background position of just the X part to only show the right facing frames. So by shifting the X, we can choose between left and right. We can shift the color by playing with background position Y. And so again, in order as they appear in the sprite sheet, we, we have red is uh, needs to be nudged this much for it to be visible, orange, yellow, green, and purple. So this is just raw CSS, but if you were using a preprocessor like SAS, you could probably clean this up, make it look a little bit easier to parse. Next, we're going to layer that shadow image under the character, and that's also a background image. All these images are available in the project download, by the way, in the code sandbox link. Finally, last bit of CSS we're going to add is for that name container. That's the text that appears above the characters. So it's absolute above their head. A lot of absolute position going on in this demo today. Um, a font size that's really small, but uh, remember that everything's being scaled up by three. You would never want a font size that's truly that tiny uh, just for accessibility reasons. But remember, it's being rendered on screen actually three times that. We have some padding, border radius, just some uh, background font stuff. And then for our span of coin count, we're going to color it gold and then include just a little bit of spacing. With all of this in place, when I reload the browser, you can see that our characters actually kind of appear and look like something. This character's in a weird spot right now, I think because I hard-coded the starting position to be 3-3, three, three, which uh, isn't a valid space in this map. We'll talk about that in the next section here, but let's go ahead and fix that. So I'll come over to app.js, and instead of starting at 3-3, three, three, let's start at more like 3-10. Watch that be wrong too. Now when I reload, the character is actually in a realistic location. So now that this is actually starting to look like something, let's go ahead and make it interactive. We're going to move on and start allowing you to move the character with your arrow keys. So back in our HTML here, I'm going to add another script to the page right before our app.js file. There's a copy of it included in the code download links here, but it's called Keypress Listener. This is a utility that we created in our series Pizza Legends, where we built like a full game prototype from scratch. Here's what the file looks like. It just takes in a key code and then a callback that happens whenever you initially press that key down. But the thing about this is that it will wait for you to release the key before that function is allowed to fire again. It kind of gets rid of a lot of the repeating that you'd have in just a vanilla key down handler. And that's the kind of tactile feel we're just going for in this game. Now, so far in app.js, we're just adding characters to the screen, but we're not really tracking them after that. And so we're going to make another bucket of state. And 
I think at a glance, this might look a little confusing. So let me break it down a little bit. These all seem like they're talking about the same thing, but they're all actually different. So ID is just the string of our who we're logged in as in Firebase. Ref is just our Firebase ref, so we can actually interact with data on the database side. Players is going to be the local list of state of where every character is in the game. This is just going to be like X, Y values and colors. We're going to look at this to update all the DOM nodes on the screen, and then we'll have Firebase update this for us. Player elements is just a list of references to our actual DOM elements. We'll use that more in a second. So the way we're going to approach this is that whenever we press a keyboard direction to move our character around, a signal is going to get sent to Firebase to update our character in Firebase state. And then that will come back down and notify us as a change. And then as soon as we receive that change, we can go ahead and render that to the screen to keep that cycle going. So here we're just going to sync our player's value to whatever is in Firebase. So we'll say players is going to equal snapshot.value. If the player's node in Firebase were to be deleted somehow, like if I went in there and, and deleted it, then this would be null. And so instead, I'm just going to substitute that with a blank object. And now we want to loop through all the information that we have in our updated players and sync that to the screen. And so we'll update these player elements. So I'm going to iterate through the keys of player here. And from there, we can pull out the state of each player. So this character state is going to end up being like an object that just has our X, Y, our name, that thing that we wrote in the beginning of the video. And then we'll look up our reference to that character's DOM element on screen and player elements here. Again, the keys are going to be the same in both objects. Now we can repeat some of the stuff that we did down here. Again, this is where a front end framework kind of comes in handy with updating the DOM for you. But in our case, just for the sake of a simple demo, we're going to bring these lines basically back in. So if the name has changed, coins have changed, or the color or direction, we'll get into changing name and color uh, in a little bit here, then that DOM element on screen is going to update. But the most fun and meaningful update is this one, where maybe their position has changed. In this way, we're going to uh, look up that same element and then just update the transform. It's the same thing that we did down here. You could totally clean this up, but it'll work fine for now. Now we're ready to start firing off those arrow events. So up here, right above init game, but still within our main function, I'm going to start a new function here called handle arrow press. And this is going to take in an X change and a Y change. We're going to be able to reuse this for all four directions. And so I'm going to kind of set it up with some configuration for that. The first thing we want to do is figure out the new X and Y position of our character. And so the new X is going to be whatever our player's X is currently. And so to look that up, we can uh, look at the player's state object and then pull out just the key of player ID. And that's why we kind of have it stored and available to us like that. We'll look up just the x value, and then we'll add whatever x change was passed into this function. So these are going to default to like 0, um, to basically default to no change. But the up handler could pass like negative 1 here, or 1 to go down, that kind of thing. We'll see that in a second. But we want to do the same thing for the y also, to kind of figure out our next position. Now we're going to be adding some collisions to this game, uh, certain spots in the map that you can't walk onto or not be allowed to walk off the map. Uh, but we're not quite ready to do that yet. I am going to like stub in the logic of where it's going to go. And so I'm just going to say if true, then we can go ahead and move to the next space. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to, of course, remove this if true check to be more like, can I move to this space? But for now, we're just going to assume, yeah, you can move. And so if you were able to move, we can go ahead and write your new X and new Y to the player's state. And so that looks like this. We'll look up that same node. And this time, we're writing it, um, setting it to, to be the whatever the new X and new Y is. If we happen to move left or right, like if we utilize the X change above, like if it was 1, we can go ahead and set your direction to be right. So that's going to look like this, just updating a different key. And we'll do the same thing for left. So if it was negative 1, we'll update you to be left. So now we have a player node that has a new position and maybe a new direction. We want to tell Firebase about that to basically notify ourselves and all other players. So we're going to say player ref dot set to be whatever the new value of players like this player is. So we'll just take this much. So that will update this player in Firebase, which will then cause our value listener to be fired. And then our lines of code that update the character positions will happen. And we should see it just work. 
now that we have this ready to go, we can actually use it. And so here at the top of init game, I'm just gonna create a new key press listener. Again, this comes from that utility. Arrow up is the key code for the up arrow key. When that is uh, pressed, we wanna go ahead and fire this handle arrow press and configure it for a Y direction, like an up direction. And so that's gonna be zero and then negative one. We can repeat this for all four directions. Up, down, left, and right. And then change the configuration here. So down will be positive one on Y. These two horizontal ones will be zero on Y, but they'll be negative one for left and then one for right. Kind of basic grid stuff. Now when I reload the game and start using my arrow keys, you can see that the character moves around the screen uh, and the direction is updated too. Like when I move to the left, he's facing left now to the right. But the cool part is that this information of where he's at is not just local data, it's also data that comes from Firebase. And so if I open a new incognito tab, now you can see a second character has appeared. So in this tab, I can move this character around and you see the change happen in the other tab. We can do the same thing over here. So now we have the space that we can interact with and like hang out in together. Now we have a bit of a syncing issue. I have left the game in the other tab, but our character that was in that tab, I guess it's this yellow one, uh, is still around and lingering. So now we need to be listening for players to exit the game. And when they do that, we need to manually remove their DOM element. Back in our code here, I'm gonna find that section where we're adding child to all players ref, listening for child added. We're gonna do kind of the same idea, but the opposite. So uh, child removed is another hook that we can listen for in Firebase. When child is removed, it's gonna give us the object of the child that disappeared. And that object is gonna have the ID on it. And so we can say removed key is gonna be the value of that snapshot, grab the ID of it. That's the DOM element we wanna remove from the screen. So we'll take our game container, remove child, just the opposite of append child, looking up in our player elements object, the key that was removed. And then once that's gone, we can go ahead and clean up that key from our object because it's not there anymore. So player elements, removed key. So we'll say remove. So let's check this out. So here's tab one, incognito tab two. I'll go ahead and leave the game in tab two. And now the character has disappeared. Now let's shift gears and go ahead and add some of that collision detection. Uh, so this is, doesn't really have anything to do with Firebase. It's just more in line with making the game. Right now I can pass through these tables and chairs and stuff. We want to go ahead and block off those spaces to make the space feel more real. Back in our app.js file, I'm going to come up towards the top of the file, just where we have some static data. And I'm going to paste in some configuration info of the scene that we have on screen. So this is an object called map data. It's basically telling us the minimum x, max x, min y, and max y, which is just that basic area that you can walk in so you can't walk off the edges. And then within our scene, we have certain cells that have objects on them. And so I've gone in and just manually added these. This is kind of similar to how we did it in Pizza Legends 2, where there are just certain static spots on the map that you can't walk to. We're going to go ahead and consider all of these factors before we allow you to move on to a certain space. So I'll come down here and create a new helper function. This is going to be is solid, and it's going to take in an x and a y, and it's going to uh, return true or false. Here in the arrow press handler, we left this as true, but we can go ahead and just change this to be is solid, and then we'll call it with new x and new y. And now we want to ask the question, hey, is it OK if I step onto this x and y? Now, the first thing we're going to ask is, is there anything at the location that I want to move to? And so I'll bring in this line that says uh, blocked next space is going to be map data block spaces, looking up a key string using this X and Y. Remember the very beginning of the video, we said we have this helper that just helps us do that. It's just going to transform an X, Y coordinate into something that looks like this. If we have a blocked next space, then is solid should be true. But we also want to consider the constraints on the left, top, right, and bottom of that sort of main area. And so we'll bring in this bit of logic too. 
that just checks that the X is within the X area and the Y is within the Y area. It's a lot of ORs all stacked up to each other. But this check all together is going to determine if the space is okay to step on or not. If you're taking these concepts and running with them, you could configure this to match whatever asset of map you're working on. And of course, you know, if you were in a different room or that kind of thing, then you may need to change what the map data is. Those would all be good things to expand on. And then here, when we call the function, we actually want to call to make sure it's negative. So if the space that you want to move to is not solid, then we're going to go ahead and run this movement code. Let's see this working. Now when I reload the tab, I can move around still, but when I get to one of those solid spaces, it's not letting me walk into them. I also can't walk off the side here or up through this building. Those are all handled by that min, x, max, y, all that kind of stuff. So currently when you load the game, every player is gonna launch at the same point because that coordinate is hard-coded. So let's go ahead and add some code that kind of switches things up and randomizes where players can spawn and then maybe later where coins can spawn too. So I'll come back up here to the top of the file. I'm going to add one more helper function. I'll collapse some of these to clean up the screen. So I'll paste it in here. This is going to be called get random safe spot. And all it's doing is taking this giant array of X, Y potential spaces like this one or this one or this one. There's tons of them. I've looked at the map asset and just handpicked a few grid spots or more than a few, you know, this many grid spots. <laughs> Uh, of good places to spawn. So there's no objects there or anything like that. You could get fancier here if you wanted to sort of pick a random spot totally and then compare it against this list. Um, but for again, for this tutorial, I'm trying to just embrace simplicity here. So we're just gonna take one of these random known safe spots and then use that as a starting point. I'll go ahead and collapse this too because it's kind of a lot to look at. We'll come down to where our character enters the map, which is here. Up here, I'm gonna say, X and Y should be destructured from uh, our helper, get random safe spot. And now instead of including just a hard coded X and Y here, we'll say X and Y. And now when I load up the game, every time the character starts in one of those different spots. And to show the other tab too, when I reload, you'll see the character bounce around to different spots. Now, coins are going to be kind of the grand finale feature of this video tutorial. Uh, but before we do that, we want to bring in some of the UI that we currently have muted. So like in here, we have this player info field. I'm going to go ahead and bring that back in. This is going to allow characters to rename themselves and then also set the color of their appearance. So with this in, the UI looks like this. We want to go ahead and wire this up so that you can type whatever text you want in here, and then that will update your character's name. And then same with this color button. So I'm going to come to the top of app.js, or almost to the top, the top of our function here. And where we have the saved element reference to the game container, I'm going to add two more. One is going to be our player name input, which is just a query selector for the ID that matches that text input that's in the DOM there. And same for the button. It's got an ID called player color. So first, when we enter the game, a random name is chosen for us. That happens here, create name. And we want to sync that name back to the element, right? So um, player name input, we're going to set the value of it to be whatever the name is. So now when I reload the page, you can see that the name is chosen and then the initial text also appears in the input here. Now we want to allow you to edit that text box and then have it sync up to Firebase. So we'll find our init game function here. And then just at the bottom of it down here, we can add a event listener to our player input name. We're going to add an event listener for change. So whenever the blur happens, it's going to go ahead and update Firebase. We'll grab the event and we want to pull the text value from the event. So we'll say the new name is e.target.value. But in the event that someone like cleared out the field and it didn't actually have a value in there anymore, we want to make sure you always have a name. So we'll default back to just creating a new random name. We're going to pipe that value back into the input again, really just in case, uh, we backfilled it with a name that we created. Now we're gonna grab our player ref again. And this time we can use a different method in Firebase called update. So before to this point, I think we've been using only set. And set is where you just blanket set the entire value. But here we wanna update just one property in that node. And so you can pass update a sub object or just an object and it's gonna only update the keys that you give in here. 
Uh, so for us, we only want to update the character's name and its value should be new name. So uh, X, Y, color, direction, all that stuff will stay the same, but only name will update. So I'm back in the game. If I take this text node and change the text and then blur, you can see that my name updates. It will also update for any other players in the game. So let's just add a comment here to know what we're doing. So this um, updates player name with text input. And now we're gonna do the same kind of thing with the button. So update player color on button, click. So we'll grab our player color button and add an event listener to that. It's gonna be on click. Now to update the color, we're just gonna find what your current color is and then set you to the next one. So we'll say my skin index is going to be the index of player colors that matches my color. So like if you're on red, I forget the order, but if you're on red, that would be one. If you're on orange, that would be two. We're gonna take that two and then add one to it. So that would be three, which should be yellow. And then if you're at the end of the array, like you're on purple and you do plus one, that value is going to be undefined. And so we can just come back and default it back to zero. So the code for that kind of looks like this. Next color is going to be the index of what we found plus one. But if that index doesn't exist, we can default back to zero. Next, we're going to do the same player ref update, just like we did with the name to update it in Firebase, which will then update it for everybody. But this time it's going to be color. So color is going to be next color. Now, when I fire up the game and I click this color, you can see that the color of my character's appearance is changing. So I can choose whichever one I want. So before we get to the coin feature in this video, I just want to do a quick plug for our Discord community. If you have a game dev project in the works and you want to show other developers, maybe get a motivation boost, find a accountability buddy, our Discord is a really great place to be. Pop in there, tell us about your project. The link to that is below. I'd love to see you there. Okay, let's finish this tutorial off with the coins feature. So what we're going for here is when you're playing the game, we're going to drop coins randomly around the map. You're going to be able to collide with them to collect them, which will um, increase your count here. The coins information will be shared for everybody in Firebase. So you'll see the same coins that everybody else sees and you can all you can like watch other people collect them. It's a pretty simple thing, but it'll be fun. The first thing we're going to do is add two more buckets, just like we're tracking player state and player elements. We're going to be tracking coin state, like where the coins are, and then have references to the coin elements so that we can add them and remove them from the DOM when they've been collected. Uh, so I'll add in coins here and coin elements. They're going to function pretty much the same way. Now in a knit game, we're gonna go ahead and just like we have um, operations on the all players ref, we're gonna start adding similar ones to the all coins refs. So here, right under the players ref part, but before the input listeners, the order doesn't really matter, but just for cleanliness, I'm gonna say all coins ref dot on child added, and that'll give us a snapshot back. This is gonna happen when a coin enters the map. Coins are gonna have an X, Y value on them. That's really all there is to them. Uh, and so we can grab the coin that was created using snapshot.val. We'll take the X and Y that were on the coin there and then create a string key on it, just like we've done before. And we'll use that to update our local definition of where all the coins are. It's gonna come into play with the collision detection. Now we can go ahead and create a DOM element for the coin that's being added. And so I'll just bring in this block of code here it's just like the player block above it. We're creating a new div, adding some classes like coin and that grid cell to give it the right spacing. The coin's gonna have an inner shadow and then also a sprite sheet, but it doesn't need any of the other fancy stuff that players have. We need to position this coin according to its X and Y. So I'll bring in some more code here that creates another left value, does the same Y value thing where it nudges it upwards just for like appearance, and then applies both of those things as a CSS transform. Now that the coin is created in memory, we can go ahead and inject it into the DOM. And then we'll also keep track of it in our coins element object. That way we have a clear reference to it so we can remove it whenever somebody collects the coin. And then of course, here is the line where we're actually adding it to the DOM. Now coins are pretty simple because they just get added to the map and then they get collected and removed. They don't like change, like the players are changing colors and names and position on the map. We don't really have to worry about that with coins. It's really just a matter of adding and removing. So I'm going to add in a, another Firebase hook to cover that removal case. So I'm going to copy over this one. 
and update it to be child removed. Remember, um, this is fired by Firebase when anything is removed from its parent object. The XY information of which coin was removed will come back in the snapshot. And so we could say X and Y is going to equal to snapshot.value val. And so the key to remove is going to be our helper. So get key string will pass in that X and Y. We'll have our game container look up that DOM element and remove it. So we're going to remove a child, which one we can use this key to remove to look up our uh, stored object. So coin elements, key to remove. That'll give us a reference back to that DOM element. And then just like we did with people, that DOM element's going to be gone. So we can go ahead and delete it from our kind of list. You might be thinking, this is a lot of work to manually manage the DOM. And you're totally right. It is a lot of work. But I do think it's cool to have these skills sharp because they do come up here and there. It's just a good exercise to do. OK, so our Firebase operations are all set up and ready to go. We're going to add DOM nodes as they come in and remove them as they come out. But there's nothing that's actually placing coins right now in the Firebase data. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to come up to our just area up here and make a new function called place coin. So here we can use that same function we made before called get random save spot to choose a safe X and Y to use. We now want to create a new ref in Firebase to this coin that we're going to create. And so we'll say coin ref is going to be firebase.database.ref and then a path to that coin. And so it's going to be coins is the name of the parent that we'll have. And then now we want a specific ID for this coin that we're creating. And so we'll uh, splice together the X and Y and a string like that using our helper. So get key string X and Y. So that'll kind of capture the position of where it's at and be a unique key for it. And now we want to actually add this to Firebase. The way you do that is uh, like we've seen so far, coin ref, we're going to set and the data for this particular coin should be the X and the Y value. Now this multiplayer game is really client only where clients are going to start sending up instructions when to place coins. It's not like a server side operation or something like that. That would probably be way more robust, but it's also more overhead and complexity for this tutorial. So how it's going to work is that every player that's in the map is going to randomly fire this place coin thing to just kind of keep having coins fire all the time. So we'll fire this once, but then after a delay, we want to fire it again. So I'm going to bring in this uh, list of timeouts. These are just millisecond timeouts. And we're going to use this in a set timeout function. But here where the time would go, I'm going to use that random helper one more time, random from array, the coin timeouts. It's going to randomly choose two, three, four, or five seconds. And as soon as that timeout is up, we can just recall this function. So place coin. We need to fire this off for the first time because it's not ever being called initially. And we can do that right when the game starts. So we'll come down to the bottom of init game and run place coin. Now we're almost ready to see this working, but the thing is we won't actually see it working because there's no styles for the coin yet. So let's go ahead and fill those in. So at the bottom of our styles.css, I'm going to make a new final section for coins. This is going to look a lot like the uh, character section above it, where coin sprite is going to link to this background image. It doesn't repeat. It's going to have this nice little like floaty animation to make the coins interesting. So we'll bring that in here. It's just a keyframe that says um, start at zero pixels um, in your Y position and then go to five pixels. And it'll just kind of like bob back and forth between that. In a linear easing function, it'll keep going and it'll also alternate reverse to sort of oscillate back and forth. Coins are also going to have a shadow, so we'll bring that in now. It just links to a dedicated shadow sprite sheet that better matches the coin's shape. Now we're ready to see this working. When I load up the game, you can see that coins are starting to sort of randomly appear. So that's working. They look good. They look right. Uh, but I can't actually hover over them to collect them yet because we don't have any coin collision code. We'll do that in a second. But for now, you can just see the coins randomly appear and you can't do anything about it. So let's go ahead and add that. Back in app.js here, I'm going to add one more function. We're going to add one here called attempt grab coin. 
So the characters can fire this off whenever they move to a new position. It's going to check if a coin is present, and if so, it's going to delete it and then uptick their coin count. So we'll take in an X and a Y here, and then we can use our helper to splice together one of those keys, X, Y, um, and we'll look at the coin state object to see if a coin is there. So if coins key, we're going to go ahead and remove this key from the data and then uptick the player's coin count. And so to do that, we can grab the ref by saying this. It's going to be coins at the key. It's the same thing that we named it up here and fire this dot remove on it. That's going to remove it from Firebase and then all the updater things will happen. So you'll see it get removed from the screen. Finally, we can update our player ref here because we collected a new coin. We're going to look up our current coin value and then just add one to it. And again, this is going to be fine for our prototype, but you should know that if you're building a production game, this kind of system has a flaw in that the client can kind of just send up whatever the new coins value should be for myself. So I could kind of cheat and add like, ha, I could get into the inspector and like add a really high score or that kind of thing. This is, of course, just a prototype for educational purposes. If you plan to make a game that's going to be played by a lot of people and you care about fairness and cheating and that kind of thing, you definitely need to make sure that you're doing back-end validation as well, which Firebase can do. It's just a little bit out of scope for this tutorial. Now that that disclaimer is over with, let's go ahead and grab our function and use it. We'll use it when we move the character. So that's down here in handle arrow press. If we have a new direction after all this is done, we can go ahead and run attempt grab coin. And we want to pass in our new X and new Y. Now when I play the game, my character will start collecting the coins as they're collided with. You can see the count is upticking as well. So I can collect all these, make my score really high. Now I've joined the game here as a different character in an incognito tab. And now this character can also collect. And you see that they're kind of collecting from the same collection of data. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the feature set I had planned for this particular video. I hope you take these concepts and roll with them to make whatever multiplayer game you're dreaming up come true. I've personally built a lot of production Firebase apps, uh, including a multiplayer game, and it works really well. There are some edge cases that we didn't cover here. Uh, again, if you're building a production game, you got to think about security and you got to think about network flakiness, like people quitting and rejoining because maybe their connection was bad or they're on a phone, that kind of thing. Uh, so it does get kind of complicated, but Firebase is a really good tool to do it. So I highly recommend that you check it out and I'm stoked to see what you make. As always, if you got value out of this video, I really appreciate it when you hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this one. I hope to see you join our Discord if you haven't already. Thank you so much. I'll catch you next time.